Easter Week, 1982, by Robert Walsh. The light green shoots of blossoms to have been are out of sight under the drifting snow. Gale force winds are rattling the old house. The temperature is far below freezing. Nature is not cooperating with preparations for Easter. The storm evokes the spiritual quality of Good Friday more than Easter. New life will appear, but not without strife, not without some losses to the coldness which returns as inevitably as spring. And who can say that the sun will always climb again on Easter morning? Isn't it at least possible that the coldness has more staying power than the warmth? The seasons are more reliable in these matters than human nature, for we, individually and collectively, can choose between love and indifference, between commitment and self-absorption, between peace and war, and we have often chosen the coldness. Maybe the ancients were right. Maybe the spring comes because we bid it to come in our celebrations. Maybe it is the telling and the retelling of the stories that enable us to see that hope still lives and that we can carry it forward. The stories make it clear that God does not do it alone. The motions of the spheres will produce a sunrise, but the springtime of the spirit, the springtime of love and justice and peace, depends on our human response to the gift of life. Let us tell the stories again. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. You might be a little disappointed that you are at home this morning instead of together. I'm a little disappointed, too. But I found a great quote this week by Reverend Dr. Emily Heath, who said, The first Easter didn't happen at a church. It happened outside of an empty tomb. While all the disciples were sequestered in a home, grief-stricken and wondering what was going on. So we are all keeping things pretty biblical this Easter. You know, we're not usually very good at keeping things biblical at the Meeting House. We are more focused on what we believe and what we don't believe, what is factual and what is story and what is science, but we like to celebrate Easter and its blend of religious messages from several different origins. We have the story of Jesus, who, after being crucified and put into the tomb, is resurrected. Mary Magdalene and Mary, Jesus' mother, go to his tomb to anoint his body with spices and oils, and the body is not there. Instead, they meet an angel who tells them that Jesus has been raised from the dead. We don't know what factually happened that day, but we do know that this story of his resurrection touched people so much that it allowed for his teachings to be passed on instead of forgotten. And Christians around the world use the holiday of Easter to transition from their grief that Jesus was killed by his oppressors into joy that he and his teachings of love and justice and peace can continue to live on even after his death. He is risen. And earth-centered traditions also celebrate resurrection at this time of the year, the resurrection of the earth life breaking through the cold, hard soil to bring us crocuses and daffodils and tulips, a sign that we have made it through a long, hard winter, 
and that color and life and warmth have returned to bring us joy and beauty and the promise of new life once again. This morning I am surrounded by symbols of Easter. Flowers and bunnies and eggs. Can you find all 13 of them? And also the stones of the empty tomb. I light our chalice now in celebration of all of the different spiritual teachings that influence us with the lesson that life and love transcends death. And I invite all of you to light a candle at home, too. I hope that you have remembered to wear your Easter bonnet this morning. Hi, this is Kate Wallace Rogers, and I'm in Provincetown, and I'm lighting my candle. I'm Deb. And I'm Bob. And we're lighting a candle in Montreal. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan. Happy Easter everyone. affirming our covenant. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace. To seek the truth in love. And help one another. Here at the Meeting House, one of our wonderful Easter traditions is to have an Easter egg hunt. So this year I thought, why be any different? Uh, a few eggs are hidden in this garden. Come help me find them. I promise not to step on the plant. Well, I think the Buddha has one. Shout it out if you see it before me. There's one somewhere around here. I, oh, I see it. You see it tucked here in, with these little flowers? And there's one more I'm looking for. Give me some clues. I had some Easter eggs in the sanctuary for all of you and I told you to bring your egg home and don't open it until you were having a hard day. Sometime when you needed a little hope in your life and each of these eggs included a little message of hope for a time when you should need it. Well, I think now is the time and this is an egg from 2017 and there is a message inside, so let's read. It 
says, you are strong, you are beautiful, you are enough. I hope that's a message that resonates for you this morning. Here's your message of hope for Easter 2020. Now is the time when we usually take a collection for the support of this faith community. Even though we can't pass a basket today, I ask that you please continue your support of the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, if you can, by either sending in a check or donating online at our website, uumh.org, and we thank you. reading is by Daniel Budd and I'm joined by Reverend Bill Clark. This is how we do responsive readings in the days of social distancing over the phone. We're not sure what happened. We're not sure what happened but we know what it's like when someone appears whose message we feel offers hope, who inspires us with new ways of living. We know what it's like when they fall short of our expectations, or worse, when they are cut down by the forces of hate and bigotry. We're not sure what happened, but we know what it's like when someone who has grown profoundly into our lives, who seems as much a part of our living as our own breathing. We know what it's like when death takes them from us, perhaps prematurely. And the empty place now in our souls is much like an empty tomb. We're not sure what happened, but we know what it's like to feel sorrow and loss, despair and grief. We know the waves of tears and the thoughts of the past which flow through us. We know that memories and stories begin to fill, fill the emptiness. Our lives are shored up with a different presence which will live with us all of our lives. We're not sure what happened, but we know what it's like to realize, to have it dawn upon us, that what we have known and loved lives on with us and within us forever as a part of who we are. We know that somehow in our hearts and souls, resurrection is real, not that of the body, but of the spirit a spirit renewed, even reborn, in the midst of our lives and our living. We're not sure what happened, but we know there is a difficult hope, a faith, that through whatever sorrow or grief we are feeling, there is also a growing sense of grace and gratitude, of joy and thanksgiving, in the mysterious and abiding astonishment 
of being human. In this wonder, we may find strength within our own sense of Easter. Thank you, Bill. If we were to place ourselves into this Easter story from 2,000 years ago, I think we would be the women mourning Jesus' death. We are feeling that great sadness that comes when your world loses its anchor. In the story, they and we are trying to figure out how life will go on when nothing is right or normal anymore. When the women discover an empty tomb, they are surprised. They are more than a little scared, and they do not know what to do next. So that is us too. We are scared and confused. We don't know exactly what is happening or what is going to come next, but we'd like to throw our lot in with a resurrection, a reawakening a new life that comes after the death of our old one. We'd like to have some faith that life will continue on after this experience of grief and loss, that we are resilient, that we will make it through this. Already, we are getting a glimmer of what this new life will be like, less consuming, more contemplating, less traveling, more deepening our roots right where we are, less productivity and perfection, more creativity and heart and forgiveness, less physical connection with others, but a deeper sense that we are all in the same boat all over the world deeper care and love for our neighbors. We are already learning how to orient ourselves toward the light that is breaking into our self-quarantined lives. So we're not sure what happened and we're not sure what comes next, but we do know that all around us the earth is returning to life and we are creating our new lives, and we are ready to celebrate hope this morning in whatever form that takes. Eggs and chicks and bunnies will celebrate those life-giving symbols. Crocuses pushing through the earth, we will revel in their resilience. A resurrection of hope, we'll embody it ourselves just by facing the rest of today with whatever strength and courage and happiness we can muster. We dedicate our service this morning to Hope Reborn, and we send our hope this morning to those who most need it, to those who are sick and those who are caring for them. We end our Easter service with this message of love and recovery from artist Linda Scherer. I wish you all a very happy Easter. Amen and blessed be.
Wallace Rogers in Provincetown and I'm lighting my candle. Maybe. Go, go, go. The TV is on. The TV is on. The TV is on. If I had to leave planet Earth and could only take three things that I could fit into my backpack, this is what I'd take. First, I'd look up into the sky and I'd take the color blue because I doubt anywhere in the universe there is a blue more sparkling and radiant than what we have on this planet Earth. Second, for all of my fears, doubts, and insecurities, I'd take the serenity prayer because it's in that prayer I have found every answer I've ever needed, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And the third thing that I would take in an antique glass bottle I found on the beach, I'd fill it with your tenderness and your kindness and I'd spread the stardust across the universe and spread you across the sky. And if there's any more room in this backpack after all that, I'd probably want to take this hat too because hats and humor are always welcome in our home.